Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step Zoom workshop. This call, this gathering <clears throat> is being recorded. Please join me in a request for intervention, having our minds and our hearts opened to a new experience. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and you. For an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. <clears throat> God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. It's really important that we pause for a minute and look back over our shoulder. Not at any length, but just to get a glimpse as to where we've been and where we are and what we're doing here. <clears throat> Spent quite a bit of time looking at our own personal history in light of the big book. The big book reveals Bill's and several other people's experience in the journey of awakening. That step one is the foundation of a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. He introduces that in step two. He doesn't call it a foundation in step one. But he paused on the path and looked back over his shoulder on page 47 in chapter four, looking at step two. And he said, we need to have willingness, and that's the cornerstone on, uh, of, of a spiritual arch through which we walk to freedom. It's a powerful metaphor. And it shows us that he assumes that step one is that foundation. A long trench, a wide trench, a deep trench. an experience of no choice when I begin. No choice when I stop. These are, these are not poetic terms. These are not fanciful speculations. These are an invitation to take a look at our personal journey and ask ourselves, uh, did we experience that? And if we do, one or the other, body and or mind, we're probably an addict of some kind, substance or process. And perhaps you come to the same conclusion after a search with a variety of efforts and methods and teachers and paths, that none of it worked until we came into the 12 step process. And then hopefully you've begun to have an experience of freedom. And I say it that way, because some of you haven't yet had that promise realized in your life. Bill doesn't promise it in step one. He promises that you'll understand it and that you'll experience it, but not that you'll conquer it. 
In fact, he confirms the trajectory in steps three and five in the promises on page 63 and 75. He said, you're on your way and you may have these experience. You may have these experience, but he doesn't promise it. The promise of freedom from addiction comes after step nine. That's a challenge in one sense because it's so far away. And yet it's a promise of hope and light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, okay. It might be weeks or months, in some cases, maybe years, but there is hope. We come out of hopelessness in step one to the beginning of hope in step two. And Bill suggests hope and then unmanageability, of course. How could I almost forget that? the heart of the matter. Addiction is a problem, but it's not the problem as I've stressed over and over and over again. Unmanageability is the problem. Restless, irritable, and discontent is the problem. Our selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of the problem. And we can hear that. We're all intelligent and we read and understand English. But until we do step four, I don't believe we experience it. Now, some of you have done step four, and therefore you've probably begun to experience it in technicolor, unmanageability as it's manifest in our inventory, in writing. And those of you who haven't, you just have to park it as a note and see what happens as you get into it, and especially as you finish it. The steps are very integrated. They're interlocked, organic, as I like to call it, from one step to the next. Organic, literally. At the end of step one, there's a lot of conversation about power because, in fact, that's the leverage point. That's the launching pad hopelessness and uh, pitiful, weak, tenuous hope that there is a power. And we enter into step four, chapter, step two, chapter four on page 45. And he says, and he confirms lack of power is our dilemma. And then he begins guiding us on the path of the search for power. That's what this is. We're seekers. Sought through prayer and meditation. We started this morning with two prayers. The set aside, of course, to open our hearts. And the serenity prayer to calm our hearts. We had a look at meditation at the very beginning of our journey, perhaps a superficial look, at least by my standards, but enough that we understand that it's a directed thinking, that in fact, the awareness and the thoughts and the feelings and the impressions and the sensations and the whatever it is that's going on that we're conscious of within our body and our consciousness, that may be, that may be the transmission of the message. And we listen, we're encouraged to listen. Listen to the tiny whispering sound. And then attempt to translate it for ourselves, meditation. Bill has a wonderful poetic paragraph on page 46. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient. We're finite beings seeking to embrace, to lean into an infinite being I hardly ever 
at least intentionally, use the word understand God, that infinite reality. Because our finite mechanism for understanding our mind is too small by definition to incorporate and digest an infinite reality. The ocean and the bucket metaphor that I've used many times. Our own conception, however inadequate, is sufficient to make the approach and to effect contact. He didn't say to understand and to know God. No. To make an approach and to effect a contact. You see, step two is the invitation to be conscious of the contact. Step 11 is the tool to improve that conscious contact. Hear the organic nature of this process. Like that dimmer switch that goes up a notch at a time. A little bit of light here in step two. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, that, that's two words as a phrase that are talking about Bill's understanding of this infinite reality, creative intelligence. Oh, intelligence, the mind of God. Creative, oh, the will of God. Are we human beings seeking a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings seeking a human experience? Oh, yes. And Genesis in the Hebrew scripture, the first book of the Torah, the first book of the Hebrew scripture of the Bible. God made humans in God's image and likeness. Hmm. Mind and will. Interesting speculation. I've spent many a meditation on that. Is that what we mean by the spark of the divine? Is that what we mean by incarnation? That was my meditation this morning on that word, incarnation. Now, there is a particular religious tradition that talks about that generously. And yet, Perhaps every one of the lead teachers in the traditions that we're aware of was a special incarnation. And perhaps we are individually that level of incarnation. It's not in the big book. I can't help myself. Page 46, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, another phrase. And I suggested that you look up the words very fancy hundred dollar words, philosophical and theological words, but they're very revealing. Imminence and transcendence. Imminence and transcendence. This is imminence here. A spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. The life force of all life force. The animating reality of all animated reality. I'm not being cute. I'm not being poetic. I'm being quite theological. We began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction. Oh, there we go again. Power and direction, direction for our mind guidance and power for our will so that it's effective creative intelligence. That's who I am. Or meant to be in my optimal human nature. Provided we took simp other simple steps. Oh yeah. Steps three through nine. We found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek. We're seekers. Sought to improve our conscious contact. The realm of spirit 
in step 10, just after step nine, Bill says, now we've entered into the world of the spirit. Hmm. Where were we in steps one through nine? Oh, we were in the world of self. And we made a commitment in three to turn. And we were delivered after nine and are turned. Here's the vocabulary. A process that we are willing to embrace and take some action about and are delivered to the other side of the chasm, that bridge of reason that he talks about, to the shore of faith. Roomy, broad, all-inclusive, never exclusive. That's why I love this 12-step culture and the big book. No rules, no regulations, just guidance based on suggestions, based on experience for those who earnestly seek. That's who we are. Look at us. Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Weekly, for a year. Who does that? Seekers, page 47, your own conception. At the start, this was all you needed to commence spiritual growth to effect your first conscious relation with God as we understand God. So he asks us a question there. There's multiple questions. I've asked you a question that isn't in the big book right at the beginning of step two. What do you actually believe? And then later, how do you behave? And it's meant to confront you. I hope you did confront yourself. It's almost impossible not to. Oh my God, I said to myself at 10 years of sobriety, I don't behave at all like I said I believed. And it cracked me open and the curtains parted and the, and the light began to shine through so that I could see <clears throat> that my original and traditional concept of God was the very impediment to my relationship with the mystery. Do I now believe or am I willing to believe this is the cornerstone? A very light touch at the very least, willing to believe. And then after meandering through science and logic and poetry and salesmanship on page 53, Bill asks us another question. But this is the heart of the matter. This is the bullseye. Here it is. Page 53. When we became alcoholics, when we became addicts of any kind, crushed by a self-imposed crisis we could not postpone or evade, step one, we had to fearlessly face the proposition, either God is everything or else God is nothing. God either is or isn't. What is your choice? Bam. Black and white. He's raised the bar from page 47 where he gave us a fallback safety net. Are you willing? Not anymore. Now he's saying straight up. God is or God isn't. What is your choice? And he confirms in the next paragraph. Arrived at this point, we're squarely confronted with the question of faith. Okay, I confronted myself with the question of faith. I'm a big book fundamentalist and literalist. What does Bill mean here? What, do, what does the big book mean here for us to do? Oh, I guess confront myself with the question of faith. What is it? And I looked it up in the dictionary as you did, faith and belief and trust. And I chased my tail because none of it was clear. But I had been given now this third time through the work, 10 years sober, 1994 to 1996, a two-year process of going through the steps one through 12, which broadened and deepened my awakening. 
the man had introduced me to the set aside prayer. I believe that was the key that unlocked the door. Then he took me into unmanageability for the very first time. And again, I had a deeper experience of hopelessness. 10 years sober and my life is unmanageable on my own power. I did not know that until I had that experience with page 52 and page 62, like you have been invited to. And then asking those questions, what do I believe and what do I, how do I behave? Again, another key that unlocks an inner door to my inner self in a way that had never been cracked open before. In step one, I saw that the human being has three major parts, the body, the mind, and the will. And that explained a step one to me. And I used that same model to help me understand step two. You might want to write a triangle on a piece of paper right now. And on the left-hand side, right body, and on the bottom side, the bottom foundation of the triangle, right mind, and on the right-hand side, right will. Because this is the way I unpack faith at an understanding level that I had never had before. Is faith a function of the mind? No, by definition, it's diametrically the opposite. Faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence. So it's not a function of the mind. Is it a function of the body, the emotions, my feelings? Well, that doesn't even make any sense because feelings are chemically based, based on my perception of and reaction to reality. So they're whimsical, not trustworthy in that sense. So it's not a function of the body. And Bill had introduced us to his approach. The formula that unpacks what faith is on page 47, he asks us a question, do you believe? Oh, that's a decision. Are you willing? And on page 53, now he's asked us a black and white binary decision. There's no room for wiggle here. God is or God isn't. What is your choice? Faith is a function of my will. That that makes me specifically human that I have choice. I choose. God is. And that's my act of faith. And my mind says, well, that's a reasonable position. It's got no evidence and it's got no feeling. My mind and my body have nothing to do with it, but it's reasonable given step one experience that I need power and I don't have power and I can't live without power successfully. And my mind accepts it and that's belief. I establish my belief system by my mind accepting the decision of my will. And then my body goes, well, I may as well start acting as if it's true. And that's trust. And I have just unpacked for myself at least an understanding of an approach. My will is my act of faith. It's empty. It's thin. It's dark. There's no evidence. There's no certitude. There's no feeling. There's no confirmation. It's just vague and floating up in the ether. I'm, but and then my mind says, well, I'm going to accept that as the truth. And my body says, I'm going to act as if it's true and see what happens. And one of my teachers is Richard Rohr, ROHR, a Franciscan priest. And he says, faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence and once we accept it and act as if it's true, the evidence begins to appear. And that's absolutely my experience. As I made that decision and I accepted that decision and I acted like that was real for me at 10 years of sobriety, 
by the time I finished the work, maybe sometime earlier, I look back over my shoulder and I go, oh, my entire life confirms at least my interpretation of my story of my life. I still don't have any certitude. I still don't have any necessarily good feeling about it. But I make up a story about my life. All of the mistakes I thought I made were just opportunities to have an experience to form me to be who I am today. What a great reframing. I have an opportunity to change my story. I have an opportunity to reframe my life. I have an opportunity to turn from negative to positive. Each one of us has that. The choice is my will. Nothing changes in my history. Everything changes in my attitude. And then we go on to page 55, which answers the questions that were asked on page 45. This is the narrow bullseye now. On page 45, Bill says, where and how are we going to find this power? And on page 55, he answers the question. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. Oh. That's how. Search with my free will, I make a decision to be active on this path of seeking. Search fearlessly. We found the great reality, capital G, capital R. Pay attention. Uh, one of the assignments was to read the final assignment, uh, the third assignment, to read the big book from a positive standpoint, looking at the synonyms, those initial capital uh, were, uh, lettered words that reveal Bill's alternative vocabulary for God and higher power. Great reality, capital G, capital R. We found the great reality deep down within us. That's the answer to the second question, where? I had a vague suspicion of the inner spirit. I mean, how could I help not have that from my monastery experience? But it was never very tangible or real for me in the sense of making a firm decision. And now I could see that. I, I make a decision. That's where this reality, this spark of the divine is the life force under my life force, the supporting substratum of my soul. Those are not words in the big book, but those are my way of interpreting my meditation on this material. In the last analysis, it is only there that God can be found. Oh, thank God, literally, at age 54, going through this work three times, having been a monk for seven years. Good Lord. Analyzing, analyzing, analyzing philosophy, theology, psychology, human development, self-help, AA, steps, analyzing, and finally, he says, in the last analysis, it's only deep inside of me, and I'm reminded of Appendix 2 that says, unsuspected inner resource. Mm, unsuspected? I really wasn't looking there inner, deep down in, resource, a power other than me that is available to me. We can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice. See, Bill is really confirming our set-aside attitude to sweep away prejudice and the prayer that goes with it enables you to think honestly. So he's giving us now a second paragraph that is redundant to that paragraph I just unpacked. Bill doesn't write redundantly. In fact, in one of his talks, he said about steps six and seven, when he was asked about the difference between def defects and shortcomings, are there differences? And he said with a small laugh, well, no, in basic English, 
I was taught that uh, we never use the same words in consecutive sentences. We find synonyms. And, and he gives us here a contrary now experience where in fact he's completely redundant to the other paragraph, which must mean and signal to us that it's really important. If our testimony sweeps away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, oh, that's how. Above he said, search fearlessly. Now he says, think honestly. So search fearlessly the use of my will, think honestly the use of my mind. And then he says, encourages you to di search diligently. Another invitation to the use of our will to search diligently and fearlessly within yourself. And that's where, again, he answers that question. Join us on the broad highway. What a great metaphor capital B, capital H. There's no place to go. God's not missing. God's not absent. God doesn't come and go. God is or God isn't. God is everything or there is no God. He confirms on page 53. With this attitude, you cannot fail. What attitude is that, I say, as a literalist? Oh, search fearlessly, search diligently, think honestly. Those are the attitudes. And I'm, I'm reminded of the vocabulary from yachting. I'm not a yachter, but I understand the vocabulary. And they talk about the position of the mast so that the sail can pick up the wind to empower the boat forward. It's a great image. The position of the mast is the attitude of the boat so that the sail can catch the wind to empower the boat. The root word of spirituality, spirit, is spiros in Greek, breath the breath of God, the wind of the spirit. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Oh, step two, came to believe. And here I am at 10 years of sobriety, having done this work twice before, and my agnosticism was not an impediment to my spiritual awakening in those two prior journeys. But it's a progressive, organic journey. That dimmer switch really captures it. And now I had enough light to see in the darkness of my agnosticism that I could make a choice now and live more diligently and consistently with that decision, a very conscious decision. Next week, I'd like to have you read the balance of this chapter and also the balance of Bill's story. We looked at pages one through eight when we looked at step one and we saw Bill's bottom on page eight. And then, of course, the knock at the door, which is the beginning of Bill's resurrection, to use a term that has loaded history to it. And I don't mean to do that. It's not in the big book. But it is his reintegration. It is his climb back out of the darkness and hopelessness into the light, pages 9 through 16, and I'd like to just go over it in summary form next week because that's Bill's spiritual experience and spiritual awakening and the change and the impact and the manifestation of that. And then have you finish step two by answering the questions in assignment a, what qualities, what qualities and attributes do you need and want God to be and have? You're not creating God. Let's get really clear on that. That would be silly. 
naive, preposterous. We're not creating this reality. We're creating our concept for ourselves of this reality. And as human beings, that's, we need to do that. But our concept of this reality will change as we do. So let's talk to some people. And it was like, okay, you're allowed to have the thought. God's putting something in you. And now what, what else would it, did it help me? What is God telling me now? There's something going on inside here in my soul. I'm not managing something the way I said, so there's something going on with my control. There's something going on with me not letting go. So that's why I'm running to escape into to an addiction. And I was able to stop and it was that, that, I don't know if that's a God moment, but I was like, okay, thought, okay, thought. After I thought about it, okay, there's a thought and there's a hunger and then there's a God emptiness inside me. And it was really, really powerful. Like, it was really like, I, I tear it up then. Like, I was like, oh, I'm not managing that child. And I want that freaking child to just do what I want and to clean up what I want. And I want my husband to do this and I want I don't know what I, I all the things I want and I want the house to be sparkling clean and not messed up you know can you all see what I want and I'm like no and then I realized the connection I don't know if I'm answering it but like the connection of how unmanageable like my life is and how I take the addiction and then if I have space for God I get the answer so I don't know if that helps no, it, 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 no see but now you were sharing authentically your experience and that's wonderful because what you're I, I hope you're aware of the consciousness that you have however I also hope that you're aware of the consciousness and its ineffectiveness because it sounds like you slipped off the rails with that and didn't make the conclusion that you wanted to make and the promise of the big book is that you will be placed at the end of step nine. You will be placed in a position of neutrality. And that kind of awareness and fight will not, will not happen. You'll just be neutral. I can sit at a table with other people drinking, and I'm not even thinking about their drinking. I can go to the store and walk down the wine aisle and, and be oblivious to it. It's not like there's any, any, any power of attraction at all because I've been placed in a position of neutrality. But I didn't do that. You see, you, you talked about control. You're not going to be relieved of the control issue. You're going to be relieved of the delusion of control because you don't have any control. <laughs> That's a delusion. We do not have any control outside or inside of ourselves. Well, at least that's my experience with it. You, you may, the people on the call may have a different experience, but control is a word that I, I, I got rid of about 30 years ago with these experiences. And I use the word now, and you've heard me say it, influence. I don't have any control. None, 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 none. I don't even want control. I want to be able to know what I influence and what I can't influence. And there's the balancing act of emotional sobriety. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's great. But, but, but the benefit here of, of the work that you're doing and that you've done is a consciousness about all of this. And, and that's the beginning of a spiritual awakening. Right. It's also interesting. Like, I feel like every time I feel that, like, not control or, you know, there's a sadness that happens. Mm -hmm. Sure. I see, I see the void. Yeah. You know, the void. Like, yeah. that the sense of how I try so hard to control because if it's all controlled, I'll be okay. But it's yeah. never okay because I can never, like you said, it's influence. And you're saying yeah. with influence, it's so interesting. There was a young member in my family. I was doing something and was totally not, and, and, and I saw her doing the same thing, which was, it was a good thing I was doing. And then she copied me and I thought to myself, wow, I said nothing she should do that. I said nothing she would ever, it was adorable nine-year-old who like literally, it right. was like, 
that was that's influence, I guess. That's influence. We we are contagious. Right. All right. The pandemic has put us all in a complete awareness of this. Right. But this is a good thing. What you're just saying, you're contagious in the sense that you modeled some positive behavior and the nine-year-old picked it up. I think that's what you were saying. It was a positive yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. I, said, I actually said a prayer. So I, like, I took out book and right. then all of a sudden he was doing it and I was like yeah. oh my gosh I didn't even notice yeah. it was happening after right. was like the yeah. power of just doing we right. we are all either contagious in emanating the bedevilments or the promises the spiritual malady or the light the darkness or the light yeah and and it's and it's constant. I'm understanding the gap that comes between me and my connection with my higher power. And I'm understanding the moments in which I want to take over and have the power that's assigned to God and not me. Um, so when you, and, you, wait, wait, wait. So, so I want to have you focused and not just a general share. Uh, I want you focused on your experience with what is God for you? How, wh when you say the word God, what does it mean for you? It, what it means is that it's a um, power that protects me and provides regardless of my um, status or situation in life. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, and what's your experience with the assignments so far then on step two? I have to look for the sheet to come see the answers that I'd written down. Um, but my, my concern, that, my concern yeah. with that is that if you have to look at your sheets and you haven't had an experience, you're treating it like a class that you think there's some right answers to. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer yeah. here. Your, your answers are just fine. But if it's only head knowledge, it's not an experience. And that's what I asked you. I didn't ask you what your response was to the questions and the assignments. I asked you what your experience was. My experience in coming to believe um, is that I feel that I believe and I have experience in the fact that God exists for me. I have evidence actually, but there's a gap that I struggle with on a daily basis to feel that power in life, on, in daily life. Well, and the, 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 I know you're using the word probably because it's an easy word to use, but when you use the word feel God, then that's a trap for us. And of course, sometimes we do, quote, feel the presence, but it's not necessary and it's cyclical and ephemeral, as I like to say about emotions. So I prefer not to use the, personally, I don't like to use the word and I don't encourage the word in the spirituality talk, uh, especially in God talk and or in meditation talk, because feelings can be a trap, especially for us addicts. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe you know what I mean by that, right? I do. Yeah, right, right. All right. Anything else? I would like it if you could repeat the uh, definitions you had given to trust and believe. Uh, not necessarily definitions, but the way that you spoke of them when you were talking. In terms of that triangle, body, mind, and will. 
I tried to ask myself, what is faith in the model of my structure of human beings, body, mind, and will? Where does faith fit in? Well, it's not a function of the mind, and it's not a function of the body, not a function of knowledge, as you just indicated, and not a function of feeling, as I just indicated but it's a function of the will. And that's what Bill is telling us without being as clear as I'm being. I, I think it was intentional on his part. On page 47, he said, do you believe or are you willing to believe? That's about willing. That's about a decision. That's about an approximation by the use of our choice. And on page 53, he gets much more laser focused. God is or God isn't. Oh, what is your choice, he said. The function in me that makes choices is my will. So that's the, for me anyway, that's the act of faith, a decision. And then my mind accepts it as reasonable given the fact that I don't have any effective power, and that's belief. But nothing happens without action, and my body then incorporates it into my behavior, and that's trust. So my will's decision is an act of faith. My mind acceptance is an act of belief, and my body's translation into behavior is my act of trust. Does that help? That helps a lot. Thank yeah, you very but, much. And I said it, I, thank you for asking because I said it differently and uh, maybe actually people will catch a little more traction with it as I've now repeated it. Um, it, it, it. It's not from the big book, but it's an interpretation of the process and it really helped me and I'm very practical. Not only did it help me with steps two and three, but it really helped me with step 11 because I meditate because I do believe that I need power and that there is a power and that power is deep inside of me and that I can connect to that power and that power will guide me. Now, how do I know I believe that? Because I do it. My body sits every morning <laughs> asking for guidance. So I know that I believe it. I know that I made that decision because I actually behave that way. Yeah. So thank you uh, very much. Well, in all, in, you know, the beginnings um, in our different segments of step one, uh, although I had a, an experience with it, it wasn't surprising to me in the sense that you know, these were all things that I had thought about before and I've done the steps before. And so um, I was getting an experience with it, but it wasn't, you know, um, it wasn't anything that was particularly shocking. But in this assignment, when uh, I went through and I was asked to go through and, you know, not necessarily look for the things that are important, but look for the things in a critical way of what I had a reaction to, it's like, I didn't realize how critical it was. <laughs> right. oh. And, you know, I started going through this and I, I was, you know, highlighting or um, circling and, you know, I just ended up with like pages of stuff that, you know, kind of once I was given the permission to say, okay, be critical, yeah. um, I, it opened the floodgates and I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it, isn't it, uh, mm, for me, it was startling that reading with a different question gave me a completely different experience. Yeah. The same yeah. material that I've been very familiar with and did in step studies and book studies, etc. But when I was given that different question, the different lenses through which to look at the material, it it, you know those New Year's Eve, the, um, I haven't seen them for a long time, but those the things, crackers. That you, the crackers that you break open and stink, that's the way the sentences broke open for me. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and in a way that is disturbing to me because huh. it reveals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it reveals stuff that, um, you know, it's talking about sweeping away prejudice. And, and I have a lot of prejudice. And not all of it, I don't think is, is bad. It's just that it's my experience. It is um, the way that, you know, I haven't, I'm, I'm just one person. I haven't had experiences with, you know, hundreds of people in organized religion or hundreds of people of faith or whatever. I've just had experiences of a few. Yeah. And so a lot of my um, criticism, like some of my criticism started with the words, like specific words. And it turned out I really had a problem with uh, the comparison between logic and spirituality because I'm like, mm, mm, mm. It, it really doesn't have, one doesn't have to do with the other. Like I can agree that there's logic in the sense that this works for other people. So it's logical that it might work for me, yes. but we don't have the same, um, we don't have the same tools in spirituality. We don't have a system of scientific inquiry like right. we do with right. logic. Right, and right. so a lot of what is given to me um, and what is proposed to me through um, spiritual leaders and my sponsor and stuff like that, a lot of it kind of sounds like, um, you know, superstition and tradition. Yes. And that's okay. But, you know, when I, you know, when I'm reading it in the thing, I'm like, mm, no, it's not logic. <laughs> so I don't want to get too tripped up about that. Um, other but than realizing it's a great insight though because it's the difference between science and spirituality science is connected to the body and mind because it's evidence-based spirituality is not it's connected to the will these are decisions that you make that you have no evidence for right and i think that was one of the things that you know really came up for me is that you know is this just something we tell ourselves because it worked for others. And if it is just a trick of the mind, yeah. will it still work? Yeah. Because it might not be quote unquote true in the sense that I think of true in the logical sense, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then I'm, I, I go back to my very practical nature. If it worked for them, and now I begin to see that it works for me, it doesn't matter whether it's actually true or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter. I, I really don't care if God exists or not. I really don't. Because when I believe and act as if there is this power, my life is better. That's all. I'm very practical. Yeah, I agree. I agree that yeah. uh, that is the root of it. And so, you know, a lot of this exercise, like a lot of my writing was just... Um, an exercise in getting it out when in fact those details don't really matter. They don't matter de facto, but they do matter to you because you're not now going to rely on evidence. You're not now going to rely on certitude. You're not now going to rely on feeling. You're going to rely on your decision. As empty as that is, you're going to rely on your decision. And that's the rudder that's going to help us navigate the speed bumps of life. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that um, I'm having a definite experience with that idea of um, not using feeling as um, my mode for an effective relationship with God. I'd never heard that before. And, um, you know, that was the, the struggles that I ha I've had in program because I've experienced great progress in program. Right. Um, and I have also experienced breaks. And, um, you know, my frustration with those breaks was that I didn't feel God in the moment preceding the break. And I knew that, you know, I wasn't feeling God because I was all gunked up with, you know, my unmanageable life and my thought processes and I was exhausted and blah, 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 blah. Um, but the point was that I wanted that power and how do I access that power if I don't feel that power? So I'm really, really um, excited about this idea of, you know, that, that I can not have the feeling and be conscious of my higher power and take the pause so that, and 
if I pause, then I can be aware of my conscious contact with God rather than my unconscious coping with the unmanageability. And it was just, you know, it's, it's big stuff for me. That's huge. I'm not going to comment on it because it doesn't need comment other than to quote Richard Rohr. And he said, faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence. And when we accept it, the evidence appears. So when you look back over your shoulder, having done that, what you're just talking about, you kind of like, oh, maybe it is true. <laughs> but it, again, it's a story that we're telling ourselves because we interpret the data based on our needs or our perceptions. It's not scientific, but from my practical standpoint, it's working, therefore I'm going to continue doing what it is I'm doing. Yeah. And, and then one more comment on yeah. the um, kind of the things that hold me up. And when I was going through this, I realized that a lot of my um, judgments were against individual people and my experience with, um, with individual people. So, you know, the, the idea of that, um, you know, that back in the day, um, before we had, he was talking about logic, and before we had this rapid increase in our um, technology and stuff, like back in the day, um, everything was superstition based and traditions and fixed right. ideas. Right. And in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've had so many sponsors in program that felt like what they were telling me was superstition. And, you know, these traditions and fixed ideas, not traditions in the sense of the traditions of the big book, right. the traditions that were outside of the big book right. that were just these very rigid um, ideas that, you know, in my mind were biased and unreasonable. Right. And, and what I realized by, you know, having this reaction to what he's saying in the book and being like, well, I know plenty of people in program like <laughs> is that I'm focusing on the other. I'm not focusing on myself. Yeah. Yeah. And that all of my judgments of what he's saying is actually judgments of other people. And I don't need to worry about that. Like that's not an important piece yeah. for me to get, you know, get on board with this acceptance of um, God. Right, right, yeah. I'm almost embarrassed in, in what I'm, I'm actually thinking. Uh, so I... Um, you know, I've got a pretty big negativity bias, and that's kind of what I've been thinking about in general, just about my program, you know, in the past uh, five years. And um, so, you know, I was looking at the material and I thought, okay, I do believe my life is unmanageable and I do believe there's a higher power. And I guess, uh, you know, where I was going before I started listening to you this morning was that you know, I'm not so sure the higher power, you know, that has the power is benevolent. I mean, I don't think it's against me, but I mean, I think I'm still trying, okay, there's this higher power, there's power. And then I'm still trying to make sure I'm okay, you know, be self-reliant. And, you know, I have this image of, you know, there's an ant on my wall and I just go and smash the ant. I'm not mad at the ant, but, you know, I feel like God is neutral. And there's a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff in the world. And I'm still trying to make sure this bad stuff doesn't happen to me. Like, um, like just as a very general thing, you know, as we lead up into winter and the election and the pandemic, you know, I've got about 100 pounds of rice and beans over here. And my sponsor, my old sponsor was like, um, you know, kind of laughing at me and like, God will provide. Well, I'm just not at the point where I'm trusting God. I do believe in a higher power. I do think I need power, but I don't know. That's that's where I'm at. Well, um, yeah, I think what you're di you're dis you're discerning about, which is just right at the heart of the human nature, is so. I have free will. And I need to be responsible and adult about using it. 
if I want to make sure that I can replace my house if it burns down, I have insurance. I trust God. But I also, I'm very practical. I need a replacement insurance policy for my house. Or if I have a sense that there's going to be whatever, I don't want to be in a position where I'm bereft of uh, resources for food. So I'm going to stock the pantry. If I sit home with an empty pantry praying for God to provide a hot dog, I'm going to starve to death. So I, my interpretation is I need 100 pounds of rice and beans. All right. I think that's responsible adulthood personally, not the 100 pounds of uh, beans and rice. I don't mean the interpretation. I meant yeah. the, 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 the discernment of it. What, and that is the serenity prayer, isn't it? What can I influence? What am I responsible for? And what am I not responsible for? I'm not responsible for other people's choices and behavior. So I can neutralize that judgment. I can observe it. I can evaluate it. But I'm not responsible for anything except myself and my actions and my reactions. Well, you know, my understanding is, you know, you can have faith or fear. I mean, you know, I think I'm buying this stuff out of fear. You know, am I ever going to have enough? You know, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, well, yeah. But what's the downside? Well, the downside is that, you know, I it did occur to me, okay, I, you know, I do feel there is a source of power. I just don't necessarily feel... You know, I, I started to think, okay, okay, where's my feeling of distrust coming from? Because I do have a lot of distrust. I realized, well, I feel a lot of distrust for a lot of other humans, you know, and I thought, well, that's really just because I've had expectations, you know, it's the whole addict. Um, I haven't processed reality correctly. Or, so you've, a lot had, or you've had trauma in your life that, well, has, yeah. that has created a conditioned reaction of fear. And that's explainable. And, and, right. and you can also deal effectively with it once right. you identify it. Right. But that, so, but I did start thinking, okay, what's my general lack of trust have to do with God? I realized I was transferring that onto God. Yes. And, um, but so I like this idea of it being a choice and I could just try it out. You know, I mean, I do think that God is neutral. I would just, you know, I don't necessarily think, and I don't even think that you would maybe think this is true, that, you know, God is here to make sure I enjoy myself, that no. I always have what I need, no. you know, and that's where I'm locked in. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm living here by myself. That's you know, your that's yeah. Oh, that's my job. Your oh, job a, is to in, is to figure out how to enjoy yourself and, and have what you need. That's your job, not God's job. Well, OK, that's interesting. So, well, what do you think God's job is? Oh, no, that's your question. <laughs> oh, that's great. See, because I don't think that I don't think that whatever that reality is, it's neutral. That's why Bill can so wonderfully and insightfully say in step three, we turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. See, that's it. I think God is neutral. And well, neutral that's, isn't no, good no, enough. You said for me. that. You said that. Okay. Yeah. yeah I good. think God is neutral. I yeah, want no, God no. to be on my side. Well, you know, that's that's where I feel you, like I could. You, then you yeah. might make a different decision other than God is neutral. You you could make a decision that God cares and is on your side and try that and see how that works for you. Mm. Mm. See, you because that, of... that's the invitation of step three, made a decision. Yeah. No, you see, you, 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 you said it, actually. I'm just reflecting your words back to you. You said that. I'm going to try that because it's practical to see if it works. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah. The, the invitation of step three is exactly that. Oh, just try it. But okay, what about this thing that God is neutral and I want better than neutral? Make a decision that it is so for you. What so? God is 
not neutral. God cares. Oh, okay. It's okay. a it's a faith decision. It's got no credibility. It's got no evidence. It's got no science. It's got no certitude. It's got no feeling. Yeah. But you can make that decision and then behave as if it's true and see what happens three months from now. Oh, yeah, that's true. I could do that. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm willing to play around with it. That's what I'm asking. That's what yeah. the book is asking. That's the attitude of the set aside. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I love the term. I can play with this. Yes, that's my, my morning meditation is a romp. It's, it's playtime for me. I, I, I go into poetry. I go into fantasy. I go into whatever to kind of explore and blow out the boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're on it. Okay. Thank All right. you. Something that really caught my attention that you said is my will's decision is an act of faith. Yeah. And um, I have faith and I also experience fear. And I think yes. that I, I believe that I can have faith. I do have faith. And at the same time, um, I'm working with that condition of fear. Yes. And um, one of the things that doing my inner work that I've uh, realized is my addiction to stories that I tell myself and I believe and re-traumatize myself uh, with. And, um, and one of the things that's really helped for me is when I become still and kind of I think of resting in, in the grace of God, something that I cannot define or control or anything like that. But um, my willingness is to experience what I'm experiencing when the feelings arise, but the decision comes in recognizing the story that is going on that I'm telling or believing and, and dropping that and just staying with the rawness of the experience and it's not pleasant and at this point in my life you know it's uh, these feelings that are arising are very intense but i trust uh, and i don't always feel um, <laughs> um trustful you know but um i do there is uh, i think in my soul i trust that this is part of the journey towards awakening is just um the reality you know of just experiencing the reality of what is without judging myself, which I do quite often. Um, so um, that's really what I wanted to share. A couple of things. Um, I was particularly triggered in a very positive way by a term that you use, rawness. See, I think what's happening is that you're having a spiritual awakening in terms of becoming more conscious. When you use the term rawness of reality, it's kind of like, well, okay, you're seeing stuff that you've not seen before. That's, that's a very powerful, deep word. And um, also you mentioned that um, about, and, and the previous speakers have talked about fear and faith. They're not mutually exclusive as I perceive it. Fear and faith live together. But look at my, look at here. This is a teeter totter. The more faith I have, the less fear I have. The more fear I have, the less faith I have, faith I have. But they it coexist. And faith is that decision. And how strong is your decision? And do you behave like it? And if you do, then you'll have. Uh, more trust and uh, a component of the fourth step, uh, the fear inventory. Uh, Bill elaborates on that. He talks about the fear and trust. Fear comes from self-reliance and the trust comes from God-reliance. But that's just a decision that we translate into action. And again, it's a reciprocal relationship, faith or fear, but they coexist. And on a, di on a different day, 
they might be stronger based on whatever, lack of sleep or too much coffee. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, um, I'll be very honest with you, it's not pleasant to experience uh, to these feelings and to, to, you know, the rawness of these feelings yeah, yeah. Um, and thoughts or whatever, but um, just, just feeling them in the body and just, you know what I'm saying, without the story, without the storyline. That's huge. That's huge. The biggest gift of doing the process three different times, if I were to summarize it today, anyway, this is my consciousness, was the realization of what you're saying, that we have a story. Uh, about 80% of it is wrong, but we live through our story and that's why we suffer. Yes. And the step process begins to mm, dissect and deconstruct the story to reframe it to the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. This is um, definitely making me think, you know, um, when, when um, you know, I've, I've had plenty of experience with step two and, you know, even going through this process and, um, it seems like every time it stands out more and more. I'm glad you talked to, um, mentioned about, and everyone too, um, sharing my experience. You know, I went through the questions and I wrote down most of them, wrote down, I had my answers, you know, um, what, um, <clears throat> what I believe um, God, who God is, you know, I, I was baffled somewhat because um, I saw, um, you said you didn't want to know what I, no feel or want and then when I thought about um what God is to me um and a lot of folks have been talking about it I really based my belief on what God is on feelings um, right right I'm, I'm grateful that um you know one of the things that I have even memorized and carry around with me is the fundamental idea of God is in every man woman and child and um, so I've been kind of, you know, using that as my basis for my belief in God. You know, I'm the type of person who has the majority of my life always been dependent on something mm -hmm. or somebody else. Yeah. And believed, you know, what my definition of being, and I'm grateful for that chapter two, the agnostics, um, I've always um, believed, you know, um, like God is real. And I believe that, you know, God was in church and religion and all that, you know, I related all that to God. And God was out there in heaven, up there in heaven somewhere. And I'm down here on earth living life. And I believe that he was up there and he was real. But my, my definition for being agnostic is that, um, I believe in the existence of God, but I'm living as if there is no God. And that's how, that's how I'm, I've always um, lived being dependent on something or somebody else. So now... It's a great insight, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, my, um, since I've had so many struggles and so much pain with believing in something or somebody else i'm really practicing i'm in a place now where i'm really practicing my dependence on my higher power and i, I really um practice living like god is inside of me now of course you know i'm grateful to know that i don't have to be a saint and i'm not <laughs> and i'm not perfect because i have found that through my own fallacies through my own um, insecurities, all of the character defects that I do fall short. You know, I'm practicing also not beating myself up so much because I know that I'm going to fall short. Right. You know, um, I'm not, everybody's not gonna always be satisfied with Howard and I wanna take on, but I'm wrong for that, you know. Um, I'm supposed to please everybody, make you happy. And I don't have that kind of power either. And if you're not satisfied or, or thrilled with me, then something's wrong with me. I go through all that type of thinking. And um, 
because I had to really write down what God is, you know, um, uh, and I then had to look at whether it's a feeling or is it a want. Um, I know God is real. God is. God is in me. God is in you. Um, God will direct my life. You know, God will help me be dependent on God. Um, God will provide my needs. <laughs> I wrote that down also. And once, um, God knows me and God loves me. And, you know, I wrote these things down um, and, you know, I, I practice listening, you know, now for guidance from my higher power. And I really believe that's real. That di directs me. I have to live like that today. Um, because like I said, I fall short. Um, sometimes I miss the God will tell me in my thinking, I believe go right and I'll go left and I'll get spanked, so to speak. <laughs> Spank going by, left. Yep. <laughs> We're going left. That's a great title for a book, Spanked by Life. <laughs> yeah, right. And and then that voice would then I'll say say to myself, Well, I should have listened. I heard that voice tell me to go right. Why didn't I go right? Yeah, but see how conscious you are, and so you'll learn from that uh, that mistake, if you will. You'll learn from it now that you're conscious. That's the benefit of becoming conscious. While you were talking, you know, and I read it because I read to the agnostics, but what, what really came crystal clear for me, and I uh, I had it already even highlighted, it said, with this attitude, you cannot fail. Yeah. I need that, you yeah. know, um, because even though I'm more aware than I was, I'm, I still have fear of failure. Right. And it's not as strong or even as obvious it is, as it used to be, but it kept me drunk. It kept me in flour and sugar at one point in my life. Right. So um, the fear, I think, is healthy today to not want to go back there again. You know, so I have to be, most of my conversation, I, I include God. And I had fear of that also because, oh, he's a Jesus freak. <laughs> Here he comes talking about God, you know, even in my sharing today, you know, if I'm on a Zoom meeting or something, I find myself having to talk about God and um, I have to be very mindful. There's a lot of people don't believe like I believe, you know. Right, right. That's pretty much of where I am right yep. now. Oh, that's a that's wonderful. That's a see, but you're becoming conscious of the process in that you have the ability to make decisions and that none of it's connected to certitude and none of it's connected to feeling. And it's a very kind of ambiguous, vague place to be, but that's the world of faith. That's the world of the spirit. Yeah. It, it's a little, it's not frightening, but it's just so odd that the personality change has happened with me. Hmm. And like, just as an example, the other day, my mom's 91, I was mending some of her pants and they were kind of like pajama pants. So I could very easily make her some. And I thought, well, I could just make her some. And then I, I had a thought like, you know what? No, I would never do that because anything I ever did when I was a child was never good enough. I'm 63. <laughs> I'm 63. And I just, I know that I've, I felt, I mean, not now, I've been in program about five years and I feel good enough now and today and everything, but it just was so odd how it just hit me like, oh my God, I carried that from a child not feeling good enough for my entire life. And it's just, and, and I wasn't angry. I wasn't mad at her. I wasn't, there was none of the feeling of, wow, you know, she, she, you know, she did this to me and the blame, blame, blame. And I mean, I'm only five years into recovery. I just, is it because I'm, I'm doing walking the talk and. Well, once we're given the grace 
to be willing. Once we're given the grace to be willing to step onto the path, to step into the path, and whether or not we're thinking this thought, it's we're connected to and, and, and leaning into the spirit. Once we begin that, once we're willing to do that, and that's a gift itself, then the path and the spirit lead us like a magnet drawing us forward. And uh, we need to stay pressed up against it because we can disconnect at any time or be disconnected at any time. But if in fact, with this gentle kind of even resistance or, or, or a reluctant willingness, and certainly not a consistent diligence, but a reasonably kind of like consistent, and I'm trying to describe not perfection, but just like the human effort that we all have experienced. There's an organic development change evolution that happens that we don't know is happening while it's happening until someplace down the road, and it's totally unpredictable, you stop for just a minute and look back over your shoulder and you go, oh, oh my, look at that. And, and that's what I'm hearing in you. Is that kind of express it? Yes, yes. And it's, it's just so interesting here because I'm not trying to be that certain way. I'm just, you know, doing the recovery, working the steps, doing what, I feel comfortable doing in recovery and it's just happening. So it's like what, what you say, it's like it, there, there can be a lot of information, but if there's no transformation, it doesn't matter how many freaking books I read or how much <laughs> I study the big book or how much I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I know this and I've been blah, blah. No, it doesn't matter. It matters what I do. Like you always say, and action is so, so, so important. But so that's, not, that's not a thought that you're going to come through <clears throat> and thinking and logic. It's a, an experience that you're, again, going to be delivered to. Yes, exactly. And it's just the, like you said, you know, the one and one isn't two. It's one and one is five. And I didn't used to understand that. I go, what is he talking about? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, because I'm putting in the work and it's happening to me. Yeah. Without any conscious effort on my part, I feel, and just to react and or I'm and, and actually respond in a way like another example that just happened days after the whole thing with me, uh, the pants situation, my daughter, who's 30, I was complaining to her again about my hair lady who I've gone to for 28 years. I've complained about this woman for so many years. And my daughter told me, get this, mom, you sound just like Nana. Oops. Uh huh. And I was horrified. Did I? I didn't get mad. I went, "Oh my God, you are right. You're right. I sound like her." And I said, "Thank you." And before I would have been horrified, I right. would have started, you know, how dare she say that? But it's true. So it's like I'm open to hearing the truth and not getting like not withdrawing in my little crab shell, you know, I'm right. cancer. I like to be safe and secure, uh, crawling in my shell and never coming out again. And I'm just, it's, it's just, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I'm so excited. I'm so looking forward to seeing what else happens. Cause I, I, right now at this moment, I don't, I feel like it can't get any better. It, it feels like your cup is full. And for right now it is, but mm -hmm. what happens is you get a bigger cup. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm coming from an experience myself just this morning. I walked outside uh, with the simple task of taking the garbage cans out because today is garbage pickup day. And it was such a gorgeous day, blue sky, balmy, and I live in a nice area. 
that I was absolutely stunned by the good fortune of my life. Looking back over my parents' emigration from Canada in 1951, 70 years ago, essentially, and looking back at the highlights of my life, and I'm just going, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today, today, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at and in such gratitude about, and that's where some of this uh, response to you is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I understand it. It's just, it's so wonderful to be in gratitude. And even though difficult, horrible, tragic things happen in life, in yeah. my life, yeah. but I, I can be happy. I can be happy and be in a place of acceptance instead of like, why me? I mean, I've never really, I mean, things, you know, pretty bad things have happened. I've never thought, why me? Right. And actually one time I thought, why not me? Mm -hmm. yeah. And oh yeah, my but, goodness. You know, as Viktor Frankl said, it's a decision about an attitude. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yes. Yeah, thanks uh, very much. And um What's your experience with the step two exercise or assignments? Well, you know, I'm, I'm an active listener, so I am not doing the steps this time. Okay. I am listening and I'm getting so much more. I, I don't know why. Every time I hear you, I get a little negative something. So okay. I'll, I'll th yes, although I'm not doing the, the work, I did the 12-step um, the, uh, study with you last year and, and ended in June. Right. And I remember asking you, I said, you know, what do you think about me starting up again? And you had said, which I never really heard before, do I want to do it and give myself an invitation to if I want to do it? And when you said that, I thought, no, I don't want to do the steps again, but I'm listening, right. learning. And next time you, you know, next year I'm going to do it. But yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. It's just this whole thing has opened up my life in, in a way that is just unimaginable, unbelievable. And five years ago, had I known I would be how I am today, happy. And, and despite all the things that have happened, you know, in the last five years, I, I wouldn't have believed it. I would not have believed it. No, no. no mm -hmm. and, and it is my experience and therefore my recommendation that if you complete the work, meaning finish the ninth step, uh, that you wait at least a year, maybe two or three, before you do the steps again and live just like you are, close to the community, not doing the work, but treating this like a meeting so that you're listening and opening and practicing 10, 11, and 12 and allowing the spirit to have its way with you. So that, that's because that's my experience. Right, exactly, exactly. You said something very profound and you said it several times and I didn't really get it. You were talking about knowledge and behavior and faith. Um, you see the screen? Yes, it was after that. <laughs> yeah, we, I drew that, yes. <laughs> All right. So in the mind... Is that the source of faith? No. By any definition in any dictionary, faith is somehow the acceptance of something without any evidence. So it's not a function of the mind. Is it a function of the body? No. Yeah. Emotions or feelings are really good, but they have nothing to do with a connection with power or the spirit, in reality, emotions, really, feelings are biochemical reactions to our perception. So what's left on this triangle is the will. And isn't that what Bill asks us gently on page 47? Do you believe or are you willing to believe but much more laser focused on page 53. God is or God isn't, what is your choice? Oh, choice, an act of my will. 
So I decide with my will that God is. There's no evidence for it. There's no feeling about it. But I decide that it is so. My mind says I'm accepting that. And that's belief. And the body says now I'll translate it into action. And that's trust. My will makes a decision, an act of faith. My mind accepts that decision as a system for which I'm going to live my life. I accept it. That's belief. And my body puts it into action. That's trust. Does that help? No, it doesn't. All right. No, so, no, it does. Oh, um, it does. Um, um, I, oh. I don't know how you got there, um, but but I believe it. I oh, I trust. Well, I believe I, it, and I. Tr- I got there because of Bill's question: God is or God isn't. What's the dynamic of that? What would you call that? How would you describe that? What is the source of making a decision? Why is it not the mind? Why is it? Oh, because the will needs to make that choice. I understand. Yeah. Well, the first question, though, is really the, a wonderfully relevant question. Why is it not the mind? Then you have to go to the definition of faith from the dictionaries. What is the definition of faith in a dictionary? So if you don't know now, look it up and and play with it. Because that's how I came to attempting to unravel it. The, The definitions in the dictionary of faith and belief and trust were very insufficient from my standpoint. They did not give me a concrete kind of grasp on the meaning of the word because they used other words to describe it and it, it went in a circle each word describing the next word and that was very unhelpful they were describing each other actually yes exactly yeah mm-hmm. and that's why i spent time i mean it took me several weeks really of meditation to kind of come with the this simplicity of this approach which cracked it open for me because I saw that, and it, it might take a little while to appreciate the depth of that insight, quite frankly. Um, and that is that this exercise of my will has no substance to it. It's totally empty of anything you can grasp. It's a very ethereal action. It's a decision. Oh my. There's no certainty to that. There's no feeling attached to that. There's no substance. There's no material. It's completely empty and thin. And that's why I believe Bill says later on that people of faith have courage. We're driven to making that decision because of the experience of hopelessness from step one. Hopelessness because we've tried everything around us to deal with the uh, suffering of addiction and the suffering of living our lives. The two halves of the first step. We, we, We have suffered practically experientially And we've made um, amazing efforts to find a human resolution between reading books and going to class and doing exercises of different human development strategies, as well as hiring therapists and psychiatrists and trying medications from doctors and different practitioners and healing and herbs and we've tried it we've tried it all and nothing 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 and we just feel this darkness of impossibility 
And so this, and, and Bill uses this image, a flimsy reed. That's what we're reaching for. We're in quicksand and there's a flimsy reed that we reach for. And it just doesn't seem like it has any substance at all until we embrace the reed, accept that it's real and begin taking the actions that are suggested. Then it becomes the tow rope that takes us out of the quicksand. I've never used that before, but I'm following the image of that flimsy reed uh, analogy that Bill gives us. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. We're out of time at this point. We'll pick it up there uh, next week. And um, please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everybody. Very wonderful, experiential conversation.